Hi everyone, uh, my name is George Holmes. I work at the Faculty of Environment at the University of Leeds and welcome to my open day talk on fantastic beasts and why to conserve them, animals, magic and biodiversity conservation. Um, so I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds and my area of specialism is biodiversity conservation. And I'm particularly interested in the people side of conservation. So for example, how do people interact with regulations aimed at protecting species? So how, why might people break the rules? How might the rules affect their lives and their livelihoods and so on? Um, I think that people are the most important part of trying to save endangered species and that's the bit that I work on. Um, so I'm going to talk through a, a little bit of my research uh, as a, and it's the kind of thing that you might learn about if you're on our environmental science degree or our sustainability and environmental management degree, both of which I teach on. And it's this curious but quite important in many cases issue of magic um, and how it affects people's ability to conserve species. So I'm going to start by putting in four quite common propositions to you that you might find in biodiversity conservation that underpin a lot of the way that we think about how we might go about saving species and ecosystems. And the first that I'm going to put to you is that wildlife tourism can save species. Um, and you can see from the picture at the top that this uh, is, might be best seen in something like the safari industry. So we can say that uh, these lions might be being saved by virtue of these tourists spending a lot of money to go and see them. And this is paying for the conservation of their habitat. It's giving an economic incentive to look after this uh, particular place rather than convert it to another use and therefore protecting these lions and all the other species that live within it. Um, and the second proposition is that uh, there's a lot of controversy can emerge when someone proposes building on the habitat of our iconic or much loved species. Um, so you can imagine that if someone was to propose putting a road through the habitat of our, our well loved species, that might be quite a controversial thing and that might result in, in political action and protest. And this is something indeed that we, we quite often see. And the third proposition that I'm going to put to you is that people don't like animals when they cause harm. A lot of our research looks at uh, how people live or don't live with uh, difficult to live with animals like bears and wolves. So for example, we have a research project in northern Spain looking at how sheep farmers are adapting to live with lots of uh, wild wolves and bears in their area. And the particular image that I have here is a photo I took from fieldwork in Scotland where deer had been eating uh, the bark of trees, which is quite a big issue for forestry management. Um, so these animals can be quite controversial when they, when they cause harm to humans or human interests. And the uh, fourth proposition that I'm going to put to you is the flip side of that, uh, which is that people quite like animals when they provide particular benefits. And these benefits could be quite direct ones, like you can see in this image, this is a bee pollinating a fruit tree. Um, so you can imagine that people like bees when they pollinate fruit trees and um, which results in fruit or provide some sort of other thing that we like, even if it's just the, the emotional or spiritual well-being that we see from encountering these animals. So what I'm going to do is trying to stick a little bit of magic here and think about how the issue of magic might interact with these four propositions that underpin so much of the way that people think about saving species and go about saving endangered animals and, and vegetation. And the first question that I've got is, what British wild animal attracts the most international tourists? So what nature-based site um, has the most vis visits from international tourists? Um, and the answer might surprise you because the answer is in fact, Loch Ness and the Loch Ness Monster. So about 300 to 400,000 international visitors, international tourists come to see Loch Ness each year, which is more than any other rural or nature-based site in the UK. And um, I mean, I don't mean to be unfair to Loch Ness, but it isn't quite the nicest part of the Highlands, I would say, uh, as a Scot. Um, but what it has going for it is its reputation as being the home of the Loch Ness Monster and that's what attracts so many tourists to the site that they, they want to go and see or um, maybe not see the Loch Ness Monster. 
Um, so arguably, if we put forward the idea that ecotourism can save endangered animals, then we could argue that Loch Ness Monster is doing a fantastic job of this. It's, uh, the Loch Ness Monster is the driver of the local economy in many aspects uh, in that region of Scotland. And then my second question relates to the second proposition, uh, which is that in Iceland a few years ago, um, there was a big controversy where protesters um, set up camps and chained themselves to rocks. It's got a road being built through the habitat of our much loved iconic Icelandic creature. Uh, and what was this creature? Uh, another, none other than the Uldefolk or Icelandic elf. Um, elves, um, much like the Loch Ness Monster, are iconic species for Iceland. Uh, they are much loved. Um, and people were very concerned that the road was being built through a particular piece of countryside that's seen as being the home of lots of elves and they protested against this um, and here the elves were acting what we as what we might call an umbrella species um, it's a term we use in conservation to refer to the animals that when we protect them they protect lots of other animals so by protecting the elf habitat um, the protesters were also protecting the habitat of all the other plants and animals that lived in this particular place um, I think these protests were actually quite successful in that the road didn't get built through that particular um, part of Iceland. Um, and the third proposition is relating to people not liking animals that cause harm. And this is the I.I., -I, um, a small nocturnal lemur from Madagascar. And we did some research out there and uh, people were very fearful of this particular lemur. Uh, why is that the case? Well, the uh, I.I. is believed to bring bad luck. Uh, in particular, the I.I. has a long um, middle finger. Now, zoologists believe that they use this to basically poke into crevices and, uh, and holes inside uh, trees to pick out grubs and insects that it then eats. However, uh, local belief is that they actually use that to punch out the windpipe and kill people. Um, so the I.I. is seen as um, an evil spirit. Um, so people, um, through their particular form of logic, kill it before it kills them. And uh, the middle picture that you see here is a, a dead I.I. that was killed and hung up uh, on the edge of a village to ward off evil spirits. And this is actually a threat to the I.I. that there's this belief um, and this reactionary killing of the I.I. is actually um, a threat to it, and it is a threat to its survival. Um, and the flip side of that is that hyenas in, uh, here in Ethiopia, as this picture shows, um, bring all kinds of benefits to local people, and they're protected. I mean, hyenas are quite often quite a difficult animal to live with. I mean, even in Ethiopia, they, they bring some harm, for example. They've been known to, to kill people on occasion, particularly small children, but they're they're actively encouraged and more than just merely tolerated in Ethiopia because they bring a series of benefits. And that main benefits relate to the fact that they will chase animals uh, away from fields. So they're the you know, deer that might eat people's crops. They, they get scared by the hyenas, so people like having the hyenas around. But of course, the other thing that hyenas um, chase away is uh, witches. Um, so hyenas are seen as being protective spirit. They're seen as um, eating witches or chasing witches away. Um, so people protect them, they encourage them. And indeed, they, um, there's some a city in Ethiopia, which uh, oddly enough has a population of semi-urban hyenas. The hyenas actually come into the city at night and they're actually encouraged to do this uh, to the extent that on the walls of the city, there's little hyena gates. Then allow the hyenas to come and go as they please. So our work and our research in this area um, explored how different beliefs about the magical animals and uh, magical properties of animals can either uh, save them, it can be a, a contribute to their conservation, or indeed it can endanger them, it can um, lead to a threat to their survival. Uh, 
And you can divide animals here into two different kinds. You can have mythical magical animals, so ones that maybe zoologists don't recognize, like uh, Loch Ness Monster or, or, um, or elves in Iceland, or you could have animals that maybe zoologists do recognize, like hyenas and uh, lemurs, uh, but these animals are seen as having magical properties that maybe a zoologist wouldn't recognize, but local people do and that affects their behavior. And the key thing about magical beliefs is they're, they're very varied. So some of them are very sincere beliefs. beliefs. So people genuinely believe that um, IRAs are evil spirits in some ways. Um, in other cases, this, this, these magical properties um, are, are more akin to cultural heritage, like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, I don't think many people who go and see the Loch Ness Monster genuinely believe it exists, but it has this cultural uh, value as heritage value or it could be a political argument and here the Icelandic elf is quite uh, an interesting example because there might be some people who genuinely believe yeah, believe that the Icelandic elf exists and therefore should be protected um, but it, the, the argument for its conservation is more political um, in Iceland the elf is seen as a symbol of traditional uh, pre-industrial uh, bucolic um, landscapes um, so by it, it's seen as, as part of the heritage that people should care about and by tradition um, so people try and protect it as a way of making an argument against um, rampant development and destruction of uh, traditional farming um, landscapes So what this shows is that magic is, is real. It has real effects, e, um, even if it's our sincere spiritual belief or if it's something more cultural or um, political. And that it can have a real effect on whether animals are protected or whether they're persecuted. Um, and there's a lot of interesting complex dynamics around this. So for example, in West Africa, there's a lot of um, strong traditional beliefs around positive magic associated with um, vultures and as a result vultures are uh, protected uh, people will uh, not harm them and in fact they might actually look after them but the slight problem here is that there's a lot of uh, change and social change cultural change religious change going on and this is eroding some of these traditional beliefs in the magical properties of vultures and there's a fear that the, uh, the beliefs uh, the magical properties of vultures are declining and as a result this might mean that people are no longer so inclined to protect and look after them. Um, and a second example that I might use um, comes from my field work in the Caribbean where uh, beliefs in voodoo or syncretic religions are quite widespread and quite powerful and within this a common theme of different uh, branches of voodoo is that owls are witches. And uh, as a result, uh, throughout the Caribbean, owls are quite actively persecuted. People go out of their way to kill owls because they believe they are the flight form of witches. So they will kill owls um, before they turn back into witches and then cause harm to, to people. Um, so what happens is that biologists are very concerned uh, about the plight of owls in the Caribbean and they will go and they will say, well, you need to look after owls. owls Bring you benefits. For example, owls will eat the rats, they'll eat your crops. Um, but this is not a powerful enough argument to overcome with the belief that also owls might well eat rats, but they're also witches. So they'd rather have the rats than have the witches. Mm, they will go out the way and, and, and kill the owls. And this is a, a threat to, the, to owls um, throughout the Caribbean region. Which this all raises the tricky question of how conservationists do react and how should they react? So how should they incorporate um, magic into conservation strategies? How should they encourage perhaps the good beliefs about magic that protect species while dealing with the more negative ones that might harm them? An example that I would use uh, to illustrate the complexities around this and some of the problematic aspects of it would be from our work in Madagascar. And in Madagascar there's a lot of what are called faddies, which are very traditional beliefs. Um, 
around things that you should do or shouldn't do. And there's one associated with the radiated tortoise. Um, this species is highly, uh, it's critically endangered because it's, um, it's highly valued in the pet trade. So there's a lot of um, capture of wild radiated tortoises and then export across the world uh, as, a, as an exotic pet. And in some parts of Madagascar, there's a, a belief that these tortoises uh, bring bad luck if you touch them. So conservationists have been thinking, well, maybe we could use this belief to prevent local people from um, getting involved in the pet trade. If they can't touch the tortoises, then they can't go out and pick them up and then sell them onto the pet, um, into, the, into the global pet trade and this can act to conserve them. Um, However, the, the, the problem with this is that this belief is quite localized and it's quite personal. So people believe that if you touch the tortoise, then harm comes to you. So they won't get involved in the tortoise trade, uh, but that doesn't necessarily stop outsiders from other, uh, other regions coming in and picking up the tortoises. So that strategy hasn't quite worked uh, to save the pure radiated tortoise. Um, so this raises a really question, uh, a difficult question is that uh, many conservationists um, are trained in biological sciences and they don't necessarily fully understand these uh, beliefs in magic as part of a world system. So when a belief might apply, how it might change over time and integrated in how it's integrated into a worldview. So you can't really treat a belief in a magical property of an animal as an isolated thing it has to be seen as part of a wider worldview um, so it sits within wider spiritual beliefs and trying to take one aspect of somebody's worldview or a religious system and treat it as an isolated thing to either be encouraged or discouraged uh, doesn't work you have to really think about how these beliefs fit in um, to the bigger picture and the way people live their lives So what I would, I would uh, encourage you to take away from this talk is that actually, strange as it seems, magic actually does matter in conservation. Magic has real world effects, even if we don't necessarily believe in it, but it also poses quite profound scientific and ethical dilemmas about how we should conserve species. It isn't easy to think about how conservation policies use magic or not. And also, uh, hints at this idea that uh, humans are complicated things and the, the, that full human complexity is really important to understand when we're understanding biodiversity loss. So as well as the uh, economics of um, ecotourism um, or the, or the um, behavioural aspects of how wolves might cause a threat to sheep farmers, we also need to think about the, the full human experience the role of more cultural or spiritual or magical aspects in that. And that is precisely the sort of thing that you can learn on some of our degrees here at the University of Leeds, particularly our environmental science and our sustainability and environmental management degrees. Thanks very much for your time.